here in just a moment. Uh, you know, we'll have men come forward and they'll they'll pass out uh, plates uh, with with bread, unleavened bread, and with cups uh, with juice in them. And and those are meant um, to remind you of who Jesus is. As you partake of the bread, uh, it's it's a picture, a, a symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so you remember a body uh, that was broken, that was given for you. Uh, you remember a. a, a you remember that he came, that he uh, lived a sinless life, uh, that, uh, that he died, and that he rose again bodily from the grave and ascended to the right hand. We remember all that he is as we partake of that bread, and then we drink of the cup, and we remember, and we reflect on his sin-atoning death, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so it was for your sin it was for my sin that Jesus shed his blood on that tree. And as you drink that cup, you remember that. But I want to remind you, not only do you remember, but you're also affirming, right? So as you, as you eat and as you drink this morning, you're affirming once again, by faith, your great need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're saying, as you eat of that bread and drink that cup, Lord Jesus, you are my only hope. You're all, that, you, you're all I need, right? There's, there, there's no hope for me and for my sinful condition apart from you. Now, as I say that, I'm not saying that by participating that that's what saves you. I understand that, right? If you eat this bread and drink this cup this morning, that's not going to save you. But you are expressing, again, your faith in Christ alone. That his work, and his work alone, is enough. We're tasting, again, the goodness of the Lord. And so as you participate, understand, that's what you're saying. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that it is you. It was your body that was given for me. I believe it was your blood that was shed for me. And I took part in that. It was my sin that put you on that cross. That's what we say as we participate this morning. And so because of that reality, because of the recognition that it was you and it was I who put Jesus on the cross, and there's a, there's a sorrow to this service this morning, right? It, as, you, as you realize that it was you that put Jesus there. There's also a joy, right? As you, as you recognize that the work that was accomplished on that cross, Yes, it was your sin. It was your penalty that he bore on the cross. At the same time, that sin was paid for in full. And so we rejoice and we celebrate that. There's a, there's a thanksgiving, there's a deep love for Christ, and all of that intermingles together, and there's a seriousness to the service this morning. Because as we come and we're reminded of what Jesus did for us, and we're reminded of the cost of our sin. And then we're reminded of the need for us to deal with that sin. Right? So for us to come this morning, and, and, and let's be clear, right? When we leave this place and we walk out in the world, we become stained by the world. We become spotted by the world. And so this morning, as you come to the Lord's table, you need to prepare your heart and deal with that sin. Some of you say, yes, pastor, that's exactly what I want to do this morning. But some of you are going... I don't, I'm not ready to deal with my sin. This is what we call unrepentant sin, right? You know you're living in sin. You know you're doing things you shouldn't do, but you don't want to turn away from that. If that's your heart this morning, then let me encourage you just not to participate. Right? 1 Corinthians 11 is very clear that we need to be careful of participating in the Lord's table in a, worthy that is, in a manner that is unworthy. And that would be with an unrepentant heart, with an unforgiving spirit. So make sure that you, and I'll give you opportunity before we participate this morning, to examine your own heart, to be sure that you're ready to partake. None of us are perfect, right? We all have sinned, and yet we confess our sin. And when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, what we believe, right? That's what we're affirming, right? As we, as we eat of that bread and drink, we're saying... I believe. I believe that Jesus is my only hope. Now, as we, as we express that belief, that belief will determine our behavior. 
And we spent a lot of time kind of fleshing this out on Wednesday nights. And we've been talking, we, 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 we do a doctrinal series, and, and we remind you often, right? It's belief determines behavior. Doctrine dictates day-to-day life. So what I believe about Jesus and what I believe about myself, it will transform the way I live each and every day. And so as we come here to 1 Corinthians 15 this morning, we spent a great deal of time already in this chapter talking about the resurrection. And Paul's dealing with it because there are those who in the church who are saying, I don't even know if there is a resurrection. And Paul's saying, if there's no resurrection, then we have no hope. If, specifically, if there's no bodily resurrection, right? And, and so he, he goes on that that incredible rhetorical, right? You know, if there is no resurrection, then, and if there is no resurrection, then he says, but there is. Jesus is, in fact, risen from the dead. And because Jesus has risen from the dead, so shall we. Now, and you might say, I know that. Do we have to continue to talk about it? And we're going to for a few more weeks. Do we have to continue? And the reality is Paul, Paul sees this as essential, right? We're ex- this morning we're affirming our need of the gospel. That gospel centers around not only the death of Jesus, but also his resurrection. And so he's going to spend a good deal of time, once again this morning, saying this is essential. But notice there's a shift in the passage. We move from Paul's exercising evidence of the resurrection to now saying because of the reality of the resurrection, this is how you should live. And so that's where we want to move this morning. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, and rose again? If you believe that, that's going to change how you live. So true saving faith is not merely a profession of saying, yes, I know Jesus died for me, I'm saved, and I'm on my way to heaven. True saving faith says, yes, Jesus is my only hope, but that, that transforms the way I live day in and day out. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now, as he, as he begins to deal with it, he's going he's to give one more. He's going to give one more kind of evidence for why this resurrection is true using an illustration from their practice within the church. And this is a strange practice, all right? So as we come to verse 29 of chapter 15, Paul says, again, he's, he's He's giving support for why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is is real, right? And so he says, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Now, this is a a doozy of a verse, right? You read that and you're going, what in the world is he talking about? Uh, This is one of the reasons why... Mormons baptize what they call proxy baptism or vicarious baptism, uh, meaning that they're, they're baptizing on behalf of somebody else. And that's what it sounds like when you read it, right? Baptize on behalf of the dead. And, and this is one of the most disputed verses in all of the Scripture. In fact, if, if you start studying it out, and, and I can't take time to even, there's 40 different interpretations of this one verse. Right. And, and I mean, you could exhaust yourself, wear yourself out, but we can make some of those really simple, right? I mean, it's not easy to, to say, here's what it doesn't mean. Right. So let me help you with that anyway. Right? I'm not sure I can, I can dogmatically say, here's what it means this morning, but I can tell you, it does not mean that you can be baptized on behalf of someone else, and that will save them. You say, how do you know that? That's what it sounds like when you read it. Well, I know that because the rest of Scripture would discount that, right? Can, okay. Can you be baptized for someone else now? Wouldn't that be nice? I know lots of lost people. I could just say, you know what? Dunk me, right? For them and for them and for them. I mean, we know this, right? Baptism doesn't save anyone. Baptism is what? It's a symbol. It's a reflection of that saving work that's already taken place in your heart and in your life. So if baptism doesn't save anyone, and you can't be baptized for someone, then how could you be baptized for someone's salvation after they have died? 
You can't, right? <laughs> and what we know according to the scripture is after you've died, what? It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. You don't get a second chance, right? So that the moment you die, you're going to stand before the Lord, and you're going to give an account for what you do with Jesus. So the fact that somebody would be baptized on your behalf after you're gone, sorry, doesn't work that way. And, and so we can discount any interpretation that says there's a saving effect for you know, being baptized on behalf of someone else. You say, well, what in the world does it mean then? Well, here's what I think it means. And again, <laughs> I could be wrong, all right? What I think, what he says Baptized on behalf. That word behalf of could also be, has, has almost a causal uh, idea in the original language. And so you might read it like this, behalf, or baptized because of the dead. You say, well, what in the world does that mean? That doesn't make any sense. Well, let, let me give you an example. Right? Remember the Apostle Paul? He was Saul of Tarsus. And he was, he was giving consent to the death of Stephen. Right? And so Stephen was stoned, and shortly thereafter, we see this transforming effect in Saul's life. Now, yes, he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road, the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. But I believe the testimony of Stephen had a great impact on Saul of Tarsus. As Saul watched, watched Stephen die, and Stephen looking up into heaven saying, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. <coughs> he saw a hope in Stephen that he didn't have from his legalistic, pharisaical background. And so as a result of the testimony of someone who had died, this man says, I want that. I believe that's what's happening here in Corinth. Right? Baptized because of those who have died, those who have given their life, for the cause of Christ, those who have went on before them in Christ, who gave such a strong testimony of faith, of eternal life in Christ, they said, I want that. And they followed Christ. And they took that step of obedience and baptism. In fact, I, I would encourage you, if you're here this morning and you have not been baptized, and you, you name the name of Christ, and that's, a, that's an integral step to your, to your salvation, right? To follow the Lord in obedience in baptism. But this is what was happening, I believe, here in the church at Corinth. There were those who were being baptized as a result of those who have died in Christ. <laughs> Giving this hope. And, and it is a beautiful hope, isn't it, that we have as Christians? Death is not the end. So, in following Christ, they had a hope of seeing those who had gone on before them. Isn't that good news today? We have brothers and sisters who have gone on before us. And we, and we say it like that, right? It's not like they're gone. They've gone on <laughs> before us, and we will see them again because of this hope of the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see this transformation, this transforming thinking, but notice the reality here, right? So the reality of this resurrection, and, and this is what we do, we, we know without a fact that Paul is saying, right? We know that Paul is saying that because you do this, whatever, whatever reason they do it, it gives affirmation to the reality of the resurrection, right? That's his point. His point's very clear. He's not trying to advocate some practice for or against. All he's trying to do is say, because you do this, it is clearly evident that you believe in a resurrection. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't do it. And that's all he's saying. But because you believe in a resurrection, <laughs> then live like this. Look at verse 20, or verse 30. He says, why are we in danger every hour? If there's no resurrection of the dead, what in the world am I doing? What are we doing? I mean, this is not easy, right? To be a Christian in Corinth, I mean, look at the ministry of the Apostle Paul. <laughs> you think Paul had it easy, serving Christ? It was, it was one trial after another. Listen, listen to his testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
2 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25, he says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys and danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. That's Paul's ministry. In service to the Lord Jesus Christ, he was constantly in danger. And he says, if there's no resurrection, what am I doing? What am I doing? If if this is it, I'm putting my life on the line every single moment. At any moment, it could all be over. But Paul has a hope. A hope that goes beyond this life. And so he says, what? Yes, we put ourselves in danger every hour. This is something that's so difficult for us to grab a hold of, isn't it? In our American Western culture, we just don't get it. It would be very hard for me to stand up here and say to you, brothers and sisters, why are we in danger every hour? Because we're just not, right? But if I were to go to the Middle East or to China or Africa, I could easily say that over a congregation of people. Why are we in danger every hour? And they would know. They would know exactly what it means to count the cost to follow Christ. To take up their cross daily. To deny themselves and to follow Him. They get it. We don't get it. You know, Christianity was never meant to be this comfy, cozy religion that we have made it to be. You know, Jesus, before he sent out his, his disciples, the 70 disciples in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 10, 16, he said, Behold, I am sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, I don't know what you know about sheep and wolves, but that's dangerous, right? <laughs> you, you take your sheep and you go, there's the wolves, go get them. It doesn't usually work that way, right? That's dangerous. In fact, as he was sitting them out, just a few verses later in verse 28, he says, do not fear those. Whoa, wait a minute. You just sent me out in the midst of the wolves, and you say, don't be afraid? But what does he say? Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. They have no power over your eternity. He says, rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Who should we obey? Him. We obey him. He's the one who has power over our soul, our body forever. And so, what he's saying is this. We can live, because of the reality of the resurrection, we can live for him. We can give it all for him. We can risk for him. I was reading a book this week. Uh, it's called Yawning at Tigers. You can't, you, he it says, stop trying to tame God. It's, it's a book by Drew Dick. And, and he, he says this. He says, a desire for safety paralyzes us with fear and prevents us from carrying out God's mission. Something is wrong. He's on to something, right? A desire for safety paralyzes us. Is there any prayer that you hear in church more than that? A prayer for safety? You know, I've never seen that prayer in the scripture, not once. Not one time have I seen an example or an advocate to pray for the safety of one. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I don't think it's wrong. But I think we're so consumed with this idea that it hinders us from accomplishing the mission that we've been given. When Jesus sent us out on the Great Commission, it wasn't just some leisure journey. It was a call to war. There are souls at stake. Right? The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, and it's a battle. He went on to write, he said, I think we're too concerned with our own safety. 
We're obsessed with it and spare no expense pursuing it. We drive crash-tested cars with side-impact airbags. The local Christian radio station promises safe, easy listening with no offensive lyrics. Safe? Our founder was murdered. No offensive lyrics? Every time Jesus spoke in public, he seemed to incite rage. Brothers and sisters, we have a gospel that's offensive. Maybe that's why we don't share. Because we're afraid to be bold and courageous and to risk for the cause of Christ. He says in verse 31, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. Do you think Paul wasn't concerned for his safety? Sure he was. Isn't that a natural instinct, right? Fight or flight, right? We, we, we deal with, we have that in us, right? To, to try and fight and preserve our life. But what does he say? I die daily. Every day I die to myself. I die to my goals, my desires that I might follow Christ. What a difference it would make if we would put down ourselves, put down our dreams, and pick up the cross day in and day out and say what? I die to myself today. I'm willing to follow. I'm willing to live for you today. No matter what the cost, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. If we believe, if we believe who Jesus is and what he has done, then this is the natural course, right? Belief in a resurrection calls for sacrificial living. In verse 32, he goes on, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If there's no resurrection, why am I fighting this fight? Now, I don't think he's talking about actual... I, I know in our mind we, we see the Christians being thrown to the lions here. Paul's a Roman citizen. It was very unlikely they would have thrown him to the lions. It was against their own rules. Uh, and there's many times that Paul refers to his opposition as wild animals, right? Philippians chapter 3, he, he refers to them as wild dogs, right? I mean, it, it, more than likely, he's talking, about, he's talking about false teachers and, and opposition that he faced in Ephesus. Why do I face these beasts? And believe me, they wanted him dead. They tried to kill him. Go to the book of Acts and read his missionary journeys. Everywhere he went, they tried to kill him. Why do I fight this fight? Our brothers and sisters around the world know what it means to fight that fight. Can I say to you that it's here for us? Culturally, we have, we have moved to a place where we are we're not a Christian nation. We're an anti-Christian nation. Christianity is very closed-minded. We say that Jesus Christ is the only way. We say that there are certain things that are very black and white. And our culture says there's no black and white. Everything is gray. If it feels good, do it. it what's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a time where to hold Christian beliefs is going to cost you. It's going to cost you. To, to, affirm, to affirm Christian marriage will cost you. That, that marriage is meant to be between a man and a woman. Not just a man and a woman, but a man and a woman, one, one man, one woman for one lifetime. That, that God made us male and female. And so to stand for these truths is going to bring persecution. Joe and I were talking a couple weeks ago, Joe Blosser, and we were, we were saying, I, I believe that there's going to be a winnowing out of true Christians and professing Christians. As we see 
the cost of what it means to stand for Christ in our day. There are those who will simply wash away. Not willing, not willing to risk standing for truth. We see it already happening, right? Even in those who call themselves churches, who are saying, you know what? I know God's word says this, but it can't mean that. It does mean that. And I'm not saying that we should be unloving or hateful in any way. We should speak the truth in love. But we must speak the truth. There's a cost. There's a risk. <laughs> in that same book, uh, he went on to, to talk about believers in other cultures particularly Southeast Asia, and the questions they were asked, new converts, right? these were new, new followers, and, and they were seeing, you know, have they truly put their, and so here's the questions they would ask them, very different than probably what we would ask new converts here. Hey, are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? Now, we might say, yeah, right? We have young people all over the place who's ready to leave home and lose the blessing. That's not a big deal in our culture, right? In their culture, it's a huge deal. Are you willing to lose your job? Are you willing to go to the village and those who persecute you, forgive them, and share the love of Christ with them? Are you willing to be beaten rather than deny your faith? Are you willing to go to prison? You realize for, for Christians in China... This is how they determine their leadership. They consider prison seminary. <laughs> For those who go off to prison and come back, they're the ones they put in leadership positions in the church. Because of what persecution does in the heart and the life of a believer. And then the ultimate question is what? Are you willing to die for Jesus? Are you willing to give your life to follow him. Now, I, I, I know there's a, there's a movement among Christian circles saying, you know, if you really want to be a true follower of Jesus, you've got to sell everything. You've got to go you know, to the lost jungles where nobody's ever heard, and, and you've got to live your life there and share the gospel. I'm not saying that's for everybody, but it is for somebody's. And there's too many, too many of us as Christians who are saying, that's not safe. You realize that when it comes to unreached people groups, there is no safe place left. They're unreached for a reason, because it's difficult and it's dangerous. But God's calling people to go. I think as parents and as followers of Christ, we've got to prepare ourselves for that. It's possible that Christ may call us, or our children, or our grandchildren. And what do you do in that moment? That's not safe. Safety is not the issue, is it? We're talking about bigger issues than, than us in our life. We're talking, about, we're talking about lost souls. We're talking about eternity. And so Paul says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Right? Here's his conclusion. If there's no resurrection... We're wasting our time. We might as well live it up. If this is not true and this is not real, let's just go home. <laughs> right? Why in the world would you waste your time on a Sunday morning if this is not true? You could be in bed. You could be golfing, fishing, you know, whatever you like to do. You're here. Why? Because this is true and this is real. So we don't waste our life. And we don't waste our time. We don't just live it up and, and take all this world has to offer because, because Jesus is real. And the resurrection is real. And we have a hope that goes beyond this world. And so we're living for more than this life. You see Paul's point? Because the resurrection is true, we don't live like there's no tomorrow. Belief in a resurrection calls for sacrificial living, but it also calls for a sanctified life.
We see it in verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. That's a familiar verse for many. I'm sure you've heard that. And the principle is so sound and true. In the context, he's specifically talking about doctrinal issues, right? Don't surround yourself with false teachers. Don't surround yourself with with those who give bad doctrine, bad teaching. It's going to corrupt. But at the same time, the principle carries out, does it not, into our own lives. If you fellowship closely with those who are living in sin, it's going to, ha- it's going to rub off on you. Now here's the problem, right? Because we just talked about risk and we talked about the need to share the gospel. And we read that and, and Christians, we go, we've got we to gotta isolate ourselves. We've got to get away from the lost people. That's not what he's saying. We can't isolate ourselves and not go out and live in the world. But at the same time, our close relationships should be those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, together, as a faith family, we leave these doors and we go out into the world. And we take the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to transform and change lives. What does that look like? I mean, what what does it look like to risk to to follow Christ? Uh, Well, let me say this. It's going to cause you to step outside of your comfort zone. We have some who are involved with the Women's Care Center here. Let me tell you what. That'll take you outside your comfort zone. When you're, when you're talking with young ladies about life and death, spiritual life and death, but also physical life and death. We have some who go into the jails, and, and, and you know, they're standing on, across from those who have done some unspeakable things. You say, I don't feel comfortable with that. That's what we're talking about, right? Putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions that take us outside of our comfort zones for the cause of Christ. It's going to look different for each of us. It's not the same. For, for some of you, it's just going to mean finally sharing the gospel with, with that loved one or that that neighbor or that co-worker that you know needs Jesus. And you say, I, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You mean you're not comfortable doing that? You can do it. He says, lastly, wake up from your drunken stupor. That's strong language, isn't it? To the church, wake up. He says, do not go on sinning. The the way that you're living, what you're doing, is sin. To to deny the resurrection of Christ, to live as if there's no future, to live for this world and not for the one that is to come, is sin. He says, do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Now, we could take that two ways. We could take that, you know, referring to the lost, to unbelievers. He's saying some have no knowledge of God. It's because of your life and your lifestyle. And that's possible that he's saying that. And perhaps he could say that to us, right? Because of us, there are some who have no knowledge of God. But the actual word in the Greek is translated, it's where we get our word agnostic, right? There are those who are, they don't know. They don't know about God. And, and they're, they're, they're Christian. They're in the church, but they're not acting like it. And I think that fits with the context. Their belief is not dictating their behavior. They're living as if there is no God. That seems to fit very closely with what we're talking about, doesn't it? There are those within the church who are living their lives in such a way It's as if the resurrection is not real. And Jesus is not true. Could that be said of us today? Could that be said of you? You're here this morning. But when you you go out on Monday, does what you know about Jesus, about who He is and what He's done, does it affect the way you live your life Monday on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday? 
That's what he's saying. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms our life. Transforms who we are. We might live for him day to day. Paul says it's shameful to live any other way. So as we come this morning to the Lord's table, I would just ask you, are you living in light of the risen Lord Jesus Christ? The one who gave himself for you. Are you dying to yourself, willing to risk it all for the cause of Christ? You know, if you're here this morning and, again, Jesus is someone you're still considering, you haven't made that step of faith to put your trust in Jesus as your Savior, let me... Let me encourage you today to observe our service carefully here. As you see the bread and you see the cup pass by, remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was given for you. Better still, bow your knees this morning and put your trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. If you do that, please come see me. I'd love to talk to you more and help you on your, on, in your Christian life. You know, Troy would love to help you. We have others who would love to help you as you, as you walk with Christ in this new journey. We're going to just have just a moment, uh, an opportunity, I told you, give you an opportunity to examine your heart, to be sure that you're ready to receive the Lord's table, and then we'll have the men come and serve. Let's pray.